in algebra, we typically say that we study groups, but only study them up to isomorphism. And when we say that, that's just a fancy way of saying that the only properties of groups that we care about at the end of the day are those that are preserved by an isomorphism. In other words, we only care about the differences between groups that truly matter, and we want to be blind to the differences that do not. As in, for example, the difference between the complex numbers in this group and the 2 by 2 matrices in that group. The algebraic structures are the same, and so the only properties that we care about are those that don't depend upon those superficial differences. So in this video, we want to talk about how to define the idea of an isomorphism of two groups guided by the desire to show that two groups are in fact the same. If there are differences between those two groups, those differences are superficial and we don't want to care about them. So what does an isomorphism look like? What kinds of properties do we require that it has? So I want to think about this from two different perspectives. If I have a group G and a group H, and let's say that the operation in G is denoted by this little dot and the operation in H is this little circle, just so we can distinguish between the two of them. One viewpoint and this is a nice concrete viewpoint that probably we're more comfortable with. If we actually have Cayley tables explicitly drawn out for our two groups, which is only possible when the groups are finite, but let's suppose that we do for a moment, we'll be able to spot that those two groups are the same when their Cayley tables have an identical structure. Just like on the last slide, we can sort of color code the elements and notice that the color codes are exactly the same for both. The only difference is potentially the names of the elements. So, just as an example, let's take a, an even closer look at these two Cayley tables, G and H, from the introduction, um, and see in what sense these two groups can be said to be the same. The names of elements shouldn't matter, so again, the color code that we assign to these two Cayley tables, we notice the color code was exactly the same. So the underlying structure of G and the underlying structure of H are identical. So I think it's a pretty easy sell that G and H abstractly are the same group, that there's an isomorphism, that all I have to do to get one of these groups out of the other is just change the names of the elements in the way that's specified. Associate to one, the this 2 by 2 matrix. Associate to negative one, this 2 by 2 matrix. Associate to i, that 2 by 2 matrix. And associate to minus i, that 2 by 2 matrix. So if I make those associations, I get a, co a comparison between these two groups that shows they're the same. But there's another thing that we want not to matter not just the names of the elements in a group, but indeed the ways in which we order the elements in those groups in a Cayley table. So what would happen, for example, if I took the two middle columns of my Cayley table here and I just traded places. So I placed the i first before the negative ones, just flip-flop these two columns. If I did that, I would get a different color coding of the elements in this table. And so we want not to be fooled by that difference either. That too is a superficial difference. After all, a group is characterized in part by its set of elements, and a set of elements doesn't have a natural ordering attached to it, right? If I rearrange the elements in a set, I still get the same set. So we also need to know how not to be fooled by the order in which elements appear in a Cayley table. Well, the way that we can do that is to take a closer look at how the elements interact with one another. What are the products of elements look like in one of these Cayley tables versus the other? So for example, if I take the elements that I'm calling i and negative 1 in these two Cayley tables on the left, and I multiply, in other words, use the operation of this group to combine them together into a product, notice that in both cases, I get the same answer, minus i. Right? i times negative 1, i times negative 1, those products are the same. And not only are they the same, they're the same as far as the connection uh, between these groups that we discover through the, the comparison of their elements. What I mean by that is that corresponding elements, so minus 1 corresponds to minus 1, i corresponds to i, and their product minus i corresponds to the product in the other group minus i. So the principle of being able to truly know that two Cayley tables are the same, even if we've rearranged the elements so that their rows and columns get permuted in some way, the key observation is that the products of corresponding elements need to be corresponding elements. The result of getting i times negative 1 in both of these groups should give me the same answer as minus i, which was the, the answer in both groups. Right? The, the products of corresponding elements need to correspond. That's going to be our key observation for pushing this beyond the world of Cayley tables into a more generalizable principle for how to tell when two groups are the same even if I don't have a Cayley table in front of me, 
or in the case of an infinite group, it would never even be possible for me to see a full Cayley table. This observation here is going to be the key to building an isomorphism. And that's going to be the case again, even when I'm not just rearranging my elements, but I'm changing the names of my elements, as in the group H over here. So if I take the element which corresponded to I and the element which corresponded to negative 1, and I find the product, I get an element here which is associated to the same element that minus I was associated to. So we want not to be fooled by those differences. What does an isomorphism actually do that accomplishes that feat? And here's the answer. If we want to put onto a firm foundation the observation that an isomorphism between two groups will associate the product of elements with the associated product in the other group, then first of all, we're talking about an isomorphism being a function, first and foremost. And we need a couple things to be true for that function. We first want that function to be a one-to-one -one correspondence of elements. We need there to be exactly the same number of elements in one of my groups as in the other. That way, every element from one of my groups is associated with one and only one element from the other group, and vice versa. So the first thing that an isomorphism must be is it must be a function from the elements of one group to the elements of another group. And that function needs to be a one-to-one -one correspondence, a bijection. It needs to be a one-to-one -one function so that no two elements from G are associated to the same element in H. And it also needs to be onto so that every element in H is associated to some element in G. It needs to satisfy both of those criteria so that every element from G matches up with one and only one element from H. We're going to call this function phi. Greek letter phi is often used to discuss homomorphisms, where we would use an F if we were talking about functions in more general set theory. Um, it's just a way to remind us that this is not only going to be a function, but we're also going to layer some more expectations on top of that function so that we can guarantee that the products of associated elements are themselves associated one to another. So what does that bit mean? Sometimes this is described as respect for the operations of the groups. What we want to make sure is that this function not only associates elements to elements in a unique way, but it also associates the right elements of these two groups with one another, so that the elements that are associated by this function have all the same properties in their respective groups. That's how we would know that the Cayley tables are identical. So how do we make sure that this function associates the right elements of G with the right elements of H that behave analogously? So as an example, again, let's suppose that I take two of my elements from G, the group of com these complex numbers with multiplication of complex numbers as the operation. Let's take I and minus I. If I take those two elements and I multiply, use the operation of G, what I should find is that that product is associated to the same element over here that the product was associated with over here. And the elements to which those correspond in the diagram that I've just drawn here, this was inspired by the Cayley table from the beginning of the video, those elements are this 2 by 2 matrix and that 2 by 2 matrix. So how do I make sure that the product of associated elements is associated? Well, the product i times minus i in the group G turns out to be the element 1. It happens to be the identity. That's not important to our argument right now. Meanwhile, the product of these 2 by 2 matrices in this group H on the right-hand side is the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. Again, happens to be the identity matrix, but that's not important to this argument. What is important is I want to make sure that once I know what i and minus i are associated to, the product of those elements in G will have to be associated to the product of those elements to which they are associated in H. In other words, if I first apply the operation of G and then I cross over using my function, I should get the same result as if I first cross over using this function and then apply the operation in H. So it doesn't matter whether I do my multiplication in the first group or in the second group, the result is going to end up being the same. That's what it means to respect the operation of a group. And it's a property that we call the homomorphism property for a function. So a function from one group to another group, phi from g to h, has the homomorphism property if we can say the following. So the group g has an operation, we call it dot in this example. So if I take two elements, g and h, together they would be an ordered pair that belongs to the product g cross g. If I take two elements, g and h, of the group g, and I multiply them using the product dot, right? I get an element g times h. If I multiply in the domain, if I then apply my function, phi to that product, so I cross over with phi after I multiply, 
I'm going to get a result, phi of g times h. That's going to be an element in the set h, for sure, because g times h is an element of g by closure, and phi of g times h is an element of h, because phi maps g onto h. So this is one pathway. If I first multiply using the operation of g, and then I cross over, I'm going to get an element in h whose name is phi of g times h. Okay, but if instead of multiplying in g and then crossing over, I made a different choice, namely the choice to first cross over into h individually. So first push i and minus i over into the group h over here using the function phi. So if I cross over first by applying phi to each of g and h, so that maps me from g cross g into h cross h because each of these elements will be an element of h now. So if I cross over first, if I apply my function first, and then I multiply, I use the operation of the group h to combine those elements one with another, then what I'm doing in this diagram is not following this first path, but following this path highlighted in blue. First cross my elements over, and then multiply them using the operation of h. If this function has the homomorphism property, if it respects the operations of the group, that means that the result of both of these processes needs to be exactly the same. No matter which elements I chose from g, here I happen to pick one example, but we need this to be true for all elements g and h that we could choose. For all elements g and h, if I multiply using the operation of the group g and then apply my function, I'm going to get the same and equal result as if I first apply the function to each of g and h, and then multiply those together using the operation of the group h instead. Phi of g times h, that's what I get by following the orange path, and phi of g times phi of h, times using the operation of the group h now, that's what I get by following the blue path, that both of those paths have to lead me to the same element. Phi of g times h needs to be equal to phi of g times phi of h in order that this function respect the operations in these two groups. We call that property the homomorphism property, and it completes the picture for what we're going to require for a function between two groups to be an isomorphism. And with that, we can state our formal definition. Two groups, g and h, uh, are isomorphic. So we'll write g is isomorphic to h using this symbol. Say g is isomorphic to h. Groups g and h are isomorphic if there exists an isomorphism from g to h. And an isomorphism from g to h is a function on the elements of g that produces elements of h that has two properties. First of all, it's a bijection, so that every element of each group is associated to one and only one element from the other group. But the second requirement is that it has the homomorphism property, what we sometimes might call the product rule, although if you've had calculus too recently, you might not want to use that term for it, uh, lest you get confused. But the homomorphism property is just that for any two elements of g, the result of applying this function to their product in G is equal to the result of applying the product in H to the images of the elements individually. Multiplying in G and then using the function is the same as using the function first individually and then multiplying in H. Another way to say this is that the operations of these groups commute with the function phi. If I operate first and then apply phi, I get the same result as if I apply phi first and then operate second. And what's also super useful about isomorphism is that the way we, the reason we get away with using this sort of casual language, g is isomorphic to h, is that isomorphism of groups is actually an equivalence relation between groups. In other words, we can say, and this actually requires a little bit of proof, but every group is isomorphic to itself. It's worth thinking about why that might be the case. Uh, an example is the identity function, 5x is equal to x. That's a function that is from g to itself, and we can prove that it is, in fact, an, a homomorphism. It has a homomorphism property, and it's also a bijection. It's also true that isomorphism is a symmetric relation of groups. So if g is isomorphic to h, then h is isomorphic to g, and we'll be able to prove that via the inverse function of the isomorphism phi that carries g onto h. And then the third thing is that if g is isomorphic to h and h is isomorphic to k, we'll be able to conclude that g is isomorphic to k. And that's going to be powered by the observation that if I have two isomorphisms and I compose them one with another, that the composition of two isomorphisms is again an isomorphism. And the burden of proof is we would just need to verify 
that, for example, the identity function from a group to itself is an isomorphism, the inverse function of an isomorphism is again an isomorphism, and that a composition of isomorphisms is again an isomorphism. If we can verify those three things, which doesn't take a ton of doing, then we'll be able to show that isomorphism is an equivalence relation on groups. And that fact is how algebraists get away with studying groups up to isomorphism, because it would, in some way, carve up the class of all groups in the universe into equivalence classes under isomorphism. And what we study when we study abstract algebra is not individual groups by themselves, but the entire isomorphism class of groups to which they are isomorphic. And that's the true power of sameness and difference. Once we know when two groups are the same, we'll be able to key in on the differences that matter. And our next step in the next couple of videos will be to reassure ourselves that isomorphisms do indeed associate elements and groups that have sameness. All the properties that we want for elements and groups are the same under an isomorphism, so that we will much more easily be able to detect the differences that matter.